Plague Tale Innocence was a game that caught a ton of attention back in 2019 for a number of reasons. First of all, it was a game from a studio who had previously been best known for licensed Pixar games making a more ambitious original title. Second, because it was a triumph of narrative-driven gameplay, going on to be considered one of the best games of its year. Last year saw the release of its sequel, Requiem, which carried on its story by examining the effects the events of the first game had on its protagonists. And what's impressive is how well it managed to show that. So much so that I knew I had to make a video on it. Specifically, A Plague Tale Requiem presents PTSD in a setting where that concept wasn't widely understood or even examined and yet still manages to present it in a meaningful and respectful way. Strap in everyone, because yes, it's time for my annual mental health video. You have been warned. Spoilers, of course, for both Plague Tale games, and should be noted that this video contains references to infectious diseases, war, trauma, severe harm caused to minors, and writhing masses of rats. Viewer discretion is advised. If you are affected by any issues raised in this video, some resources have been provided in the description, and I encourage you to make use of them. In order to understand what A Plague Tale Requiem is saying about trauma, we need to look back at its predecessor and get a full grasp on what happened in that game. A Plague Tale Innocence introduced Amicia de Rune, a 15 year old girl in medieval France and the daughter of a knight in service to the king. Living a life of privilege, all that gets shattered with the mysterious death of her dog and the significantly less mysterious death of her father at the hands of the cruel Inquisition. Fleeing from the events that brought down her home, she is forced to care for her sickly six-year-old brother Hugo as they have to survive out in the wider world. The two don't have a great relationship at first with Hugo's sheltered life making him unaware of the wider implications of their situation and Amicia being unable to process the death of her father. This leads to numerous arguments that land them in trouble despite Amicia's best efforts. Oh and also this is going on with the onset of the Black Death in Europe and right in the middle of the Hundred Years War between England and France. Naturally, these two factors become significant obstacles on their way to get Hugo the medical care he requires, all while the Inquisition pursues them. The game was a harrowing story of children desperately trying to survive in a harsh world not meant for them. Amicia comes to bond with her brother, working hard to be his guardian and protector, all while wading through masses of corpses and dealing with the cause of the deadly plague. That cause is writhing masses of killer rats that are capable of stripping your flesh straight off your bones. You know, the ones that were definitely mentioned in all the history books about the Black Death. No, no, don't check. They were definitely in there, I promise. The game's title, Innocence, is what is lost during the events of the game. Amicia and Hugo are still kids, and yet they have to deal with horrific events for the game's runtime. Amicia herself goes from a nobleman's daughter who likes casually throwing rocks at apples into a murderer who throws rocks at people's heads in order to protect her brother. For Hugo, however, his sheltered life and extremely young age make him especially affected by the events of the game. Seeing battlefields littered with the slain or people getting their flesh stripped by supernaturally aggressive rats is hard enough for a young child to handle, but this simply gets worse when it becomes obvious that he's being specifically targeted for his strange illness. Because surprise, those horrible rats? They have been called by something called the macula, an inherited disease that Hugo has that allows full control of the plague rats. And yeah, this was definitely in the history books, I swear. I will not hear any argument about fleas or bacteria or any of that mumbo jumbo. The plague was definitely about supernatural packs of carnivorous rats. So yeah, in summary, A Plague Tale Innocence was basically a string of traumas inflicted on children, and while the game ends in quiet contemplation as the horrors are over and the siblings can move on with their lives, it's clear that this has left an impact on them. And so, A Plague Tale Requiem starts with the two once again being pursued by some relentless force. 
for me. Okay, yeah, not really. The game actually starts out pretty idyllic. Amicia and Hugo are living a nice peaceful life on the road, and he gets to be a little kid like he's supposed to be. No rats, no soldiers, just two siblings and their friend, and the beauty of the French countryside. It's an interesting start because the events of the first game were so harrowing that this feels weirdly disjointed. That everything is too normal. Well, it doesn't last. The siblings end up wandering into an old castle where we end up seeing a bunch of beehives burned, and the residents of this area don't take too kindly to any intruders, so Amicia and Hugo get attacked. This leads to a confrontation that ends in disaster, and a chase through the wilderness. And when it's all over, Amicia finds herself shaking. Things return to peaceful and idyllic for a while as the siblings walk around a market. But after Hugo gets an attack by the macula, Amicia has to head with their alchemist friend Lucas into a now infected part of the town, sparking more conflicts with soldiers and more encounters with rats. While she manages to hold it together, the lack of flowers they require at their destination leads to more shakes, sweating, and this scene. Hey. What? You're not alright. I am. No, you're not. You're not even breathing right now. I'm dizzy. My heart's pounding. What's interesting about this scene is that it's only Amicia experiencing these symptoms. Lucas, who journeyed with them in the first game, is naturally stressed due to the situation, but is otherwise fine. But Amicia is having a full-on breakdown. Sweaty hands, shaking, dizziness, shallow breathing, fast heartbeat. These are all symptoms of a panic attack, something closely associated with anxiety and PTSD. But why is it just her, and not Lucas? In innocence, she was the one doing the killing. And that is going to place a weight on a young mind such as hers. What I love about this scene is how it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It happens after two chapters of her returning to the dangers she experienced months before, wading through slurry pits, evading guards looking to kill her and occasionally killing in return, Hugo falling ill and the returning threat of the rats. It all piles on and while she manages to power through it, eventually it all comes to a head when a major roadblock arrives. They need flowers to help Hugo, she's pushed herself to get where they can to find them, but they are not there. And that is the breaking point. She loses control, she can't focus, and she breaks down. As we moved through the initial chapters, Amicia's stress had increased. We hear the panic in her voice, we see her hesitation and her fear, and it all breaks down in this moment of frustration. But we also see the beginnings of this in that earlier chapter when her hands were shaking. That was the moment that everything started going wrong again and her body was responding to that in the moment. But while that moment was minor, this moment in the tool shed is where it all comes flooding back. I love that this is a distinct moment of weakness where it's spelled out, perhaps a little too obviously, that she is absolutely not okay. She has been forced to physically relive the trauma of the 18 chapters of Innocence. This is all stuff that she thought was behind her, but here it is again, forcing her to face it again. Prior to this, Amishi has been fine, things have been relatively normal, but what this scene illustrates above all else is that she was only fine because she didn't have to face her trauma, but it was clearly still there, buried beneath the surface, waiting for the right moment. The game obviously can't just leave her here, we need to be able to jump back into the action. Lucas moves on ahead alone, but soon finds himself in danger, meaning that she has to jump in to help. However, she hasn't had time to process any of this, and hasn't really come to terms with anything she's feeling. During all of this, she's still panicking, and only pushing forward on pure adrenaline. This means that she ultimately makes things worse soon afterwards. She rescues Lucas from a guard after he managed to swipe what they needed. They could just easily leave before any more guards arrive, but Amicia thinks otherwise. In her fear and her stress, she decides to fight back. This leads to them both being captured and threatened with execution, and it's here that she's still struggling with everything, something that Lucas calls her out on. You should sit down. Oh, so that's all you have to say? Come on. You can do better than that. You have a whole garrison here, why don't you really let yourself go? Stop! No! Do you see the situation we're in? We were just supposed to get herbs. How do you think Hugo feels right now without them? 
How will he feel when his sister is I hanged? made a mistake, right? I don't know what's happening to me, Lucas. I, I feel my mind going. While they are eventually able to escape and return to Hugo, this lack of emotional stability informs Amicia's actions constantly from this point on. In her desperation to help Hugo with the macula, she agrees to help him find an island from his dreams, forcibly separating them from their mother and Lucas, even though this whole decision is kind of nonsensical and based on a whim. She snaps at someone who Hugo believes can help them. She leaps into action at every turn, ready to kill, even when it's absolutely not logical to do so. Amicia is a wreck constantly throughout a Plague Tale Requiem. Even with Hugo, the presence of guards places her into a constant fight or flight state, one where she frequently acts without thought or strategy. She isn't judged by the game for this, however. The narrative makes it clear that she has snapped from everything she has endured. The loss of innocence from the first game is complete. Here is a teenage girl completely unequipped to deal with the torrent of emotions flooding through her in these stressful situations. And yet, despite everything that's going on, Amicia does nothing about her behaviour. It causes her constant problems, and yet she doesn't stop. Why? For that, we need to look back at the history of mental health diagnosis. It's probably not surprising to learn that psychiatry is a relatively new branch of medicine. While maladies of the mind were known about before Christ, and asylums existed as early as the Middle Ages, psychiatry as a form of actual medicine wasn't truly understood until the 19th century. Before then, asylums were generally just a place to dump the dangerous crazies, and are largely where the whole spooky asylum trope comes from. In the late 18th century, the Quakers started setting up centres for rest and recoupment that were effectively the beginnings of modern mental health institutions. Mood disorders were identified as a form of mental illness in the 1800s, but it wasn't really until the work of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung in the early 20th century that modern psychiatry came into form, although many of their ideas have been rejected in favour of things that make a lot more sense than men wanting to secretly have sex with their mothers. It was perhaps these new ideas that led to doctors questioning the mental states of soldiers returning from World War II. The first publication of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1952 identified something called a stress disorder in these soldiers, something that had previously been known as shell shock during the First World War. The Vietnam War saw this disorder studied further, until finally it was formally named Post Traumatic Stress Disorder in 1980. So with all that in mind, it's pretty clear that the concept of Amicia suffering all the symptoms of what we now know to be PTSD was not going to be understood in 1348. Obviously, we as the audience can recognise that this is what's happening. The team at Asobo almost certainly were deliberately evoking the condition, but for the characters, it's something they simply do not understand. Or if they did recognise it as a condition, it's likely they'd blame it on demonic possession or too much yellow bile or something. However, while we have a name and possible treatment for PTSD now, that's not to say that the horrors of conflict weren't understood in medieval France. Ancient Assyrian texts from 1300 BC describe soldiers being haunted by the ghosts they faced in battle, while Greek historian Herodotus described Epizelus going blind during the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. Both of these are recognised as some of the earliest written depictions of PTSD as we now know it. For the setting of A Plague Tale specifically, a French knight named Geoffroy de Charnay wrote texts about chivalry including the appropriately titled Livre de Chivalry, or Book of Chivalry, when translated to English. These texts don't hold back on the grim conditions that knights and other fighters experience during their battles, but in these descriptions he recognises the psychological effects that combat were likely having on his brothers in arms. What's interesting about A Plague Tale Requiem is how much the story acknowledges the wider implications of PTSD in this setting. Take this exchange between Amicia and Arno, a mercenary the siblings befriend, about halfway through the game. So, it survived the fire? Yes, it would take more than that. It survived Spain, Burgundy, Guienne. Well, barely that time. That's where it broke? Yes. The only time it failed to protect. 
You? No. Someone I shared my coat of arms with. Oh. I, I see. It's a sad memory to keep them. Some memories don't want to be let go of, child. I think I know what you mean. Frequently, through the later part of the game, we get references to those previously involved in war and bloodshed suffering from something similar to Amicia. Arno talks of sadness, while the main villain of the game, Count Victor, describes how war is never truly over and his only purpose is to kill. Even his wife describes the war taking its toll on him and affecting him mentally. I'm sorry. War took its toll on my husband. He gets... carried away sometimes. It's a recurring theme. Amicia's behaviour is a mixture of trauma and her young age, but we see it too in the behaviour of grown men who've spent the last few years fighting and killing in a major war. There's even a reference from the Count that his wife Emily has her own traumas brought on by an abusive family. Traumas that almost led her to taking her own life. It's quite possible that their shared trauma is what helped bring them together in the first place and build an idyllic life on a Mediterranean island. One where they can escape their problems in a fantasy of an anointed child returning to the earth and blessing them both. As I played through A Playtale Requiem, I kept noticing all these allusions to trauma and stress and the effects that the first game had. After all, the plight of the Daroons in Innocence was happening on the periphery of the Hundred Years' War, a very real conflict between England and France. And much like the effects of World War II led to early research into PTSD, A Playtale Requiem examines the trauma brought on by this historic war, one that coincided with the arrival of the Black Death. Because PTSD doesn't just come from combat and conflict, it is defined by any traumatic event, and that event can also include mass outbreaks of illness. It's something I became acutely aware of while playing Requiem. While the game's fiction takes place during a fantasy version of the second bubonic plague epidemic, it released in the later stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, the recovery period as places were beginning to reopen and life was beginning to return to normal, while the illness was still doing the rounds. It was a game that reflected the collective anxiety that many are still struggling with, and no doubt the game being developed through that pandemic played a part in trauma being so prominent in the game's storyline. What's more, I was especially aware of the parallels, as I was late to the party when playing Innocence, which I started in spring of 2020. That means that while the news was constantly telling me about this mystery disease infecting its way through a confused and scared public, I was sitting there playing a game centred on one of the deadliest periods of pestilence in human history. It was not hard to spot the similarities, even if the game had released before Covid reared its ugly round head. It also led me to question how likely another bubonic plague outbreak could be, and needless to say, we need to be very careful about antibiotic resistance, I'll just put it that way. So here I was, researching an old pandemic during a very current one, so I came into Requiem with that association already fully planted in my mind. And I wouldn't be surprised if the developers also felt the same way, planning out the sequel as the world went into lockdown. As such, trauma doesn't just come from fighting a war here, it also comes from the disease. And as a result, trauma is everywhere in the game, not just caused by conflict, but also by disease. It's found in even the smallest of places, and of people. During the events of the two games, Hugo is six years old. This is a painfully young age for the events that he has to live through. A small child who spent most of their time growing up in isolation due to a mysterious disease simply does not understand the concepts of war, plague, or the terrifying creature that is man. He's a boy who thinks flowers are pretty and that feathers are neat. He's a boy who spends most of his time with his mother and at the beginning of Innocence, simply doesn't understand the stakes. Throughout the first game, he is impatient, quick to throw tantrums, and often stumbles into situations far too dangerous for him. What's impressive about the writing of the game is that this never becomes obnoxious or annoying, because he's constantly presented as a scared child who doesn't know what's going on. When he kicks off because he wants to see mummy, we don't see a spoiled brat. We see a child who's used to having mummy around, sitting in a house he doesn't recognise, and wondering why no one will tell him why he can't see Mummy. Amicia blurts out the truth of her perceived death in frustration, 
and this is just upsetting and hard to process, so he runs away. It's all behaviour that's easy to understand and easy to sympathise with. He learns as the game goes on too, learning from Amicia what he can and can't do, and ends up becoming truly likeable, and I'm saying this as someone with absolutely no paternal instincts. He's a sweet kid, and you genuinely want to protect him from the horrors of the world. But alas, there is no protecting this child from the horrors of the world. In fact, in this world, he is the tragic source of one of its horrors. Those seas of deadly rats are there because of a supernatural disease in his blood that generates hordes of plague rats, and with enough progression of the disease, he can control those rats. And oh boy does he learn to control those rats as this becomes a gameplay mechanic in later parts of Innocence and scripted parts of Requiem. He quickly learns the dangers of his powers and agrees with Amicia to only use them when absolutely necessary, but this is part of what will become his trauma. After all, trauma caused in childhood is immensely damaging. Childhood is when you develop the knowledge and skills to survive into adulthood, and trauma can warp that perception, leading to mental illness in adults. Trauma can be caused by all manner of things, from something as difficult as the death of a close relative, all the way through playground bullying, all the way up to more severe cases of child abuse. In the case of Hugo, this trauma comes from growing up in a world of war and disease. But while enduring that trauma, children tend to struggle with their emotions in the moment because that's something else they're learning. So if a child is being attacked by violent farmhands and their teenage sibling is in danger, it's easy for them to explode in fear and anger. And you better hope that the child doesn't have magical plague rat powers when he does and oh no, oh no he does in this case. Ah, this is a theme that runs all the way through Requiem. Hugo has been through a lot, but he managed to be brave with the help of his family. At the start of Requiem, he feels like the bad stuff is all over, and early on he's allowed to be a kid again. There are many points throughout the game where he clearly wants to be a kid again. He's curious and playful and eager to explore the wonders of the world. He loves his big sister and has even learned how important her protection of him has been, to the point where he frequently expresses a desire to return the favour. However, this doesn't last. When the rug is inevitably pulled out from under the siblings again after these moments of levity, Hugo cannot handle it. He simply doesn't understand the cruelty of the world, and wishes that he and Amicia could just hang out at markets and play silly games in the woods forever. While he does his best to stay cheerful and grounded, he too clearly suffers from a more volatile childhood version of PTSD himself, and this is a problem. Hugo spends so much time in Requiem questioning why the world has to be so cruel. Amicia, struggling with trauma herself, does what she can to keep him positive, but the repeated cruelty he witnesses culminates in the actual death of his mother, the wounding of his sister, and a feeling that things will just never get better. He ends up destroying most of an island using his rat powers in a fit of rage, and then when surveying the damage, he has this outburst. Always, always in my head, Hugo. Let him, Amicia. You are not in charge. I am the one in charge. Oh, no. You obey me. You hear me? You obey me. All right. I think they heard you. This is still not the end, though. The siblings are separated, and Hugo is told falsely that Amicia has been killed. And that's it. That's all this poor child can take, and the entire city of Marseille is destroyed in a torrent of rats. Hugo is gone, taken by the plague. This isn't the end of the story, however. The explosive rat rage engulfs Marseille in a supernatural rat's nest, one that Amicia heads into the heart of, where we get a bunch of supernatural vagueness led by a lucid Hugo who says that the only way for all this to end is for Amicia to end him. Now, this is where an element of criticism could potentially be brought in, because on a surface level, this story appears to be saying that those that cannot control their outbursts brought on by trauma need to be put down. I even partly felt this way initially, and was a little bit uncomfortable with it as a result. 
But with some deeper thought and reflection, I don't actually think that's the message here. All along, the macula hasn't been Hugo's trauma, it's been the source of his trauma. Something that causes him physical and mental anguish in a world where numerous other things are capable of causing similar anguish. The trauma and the macula are separate afflictions, although sadly they both feed into each other. Having supernatural rat powers was a traumatic discovery, and the emotional turmoil it gave Hugo made the macula stronger, but they are still separate. Instead, we need to remember what the macula has always been an analogue to. The Black Death. Put aside the supernatural elements and the complex rat physics for a second, and think of this in its historical context. This is a small boy who is effectively patient zero for one of the deadliest outbreaks of disease in European history. A small boy who has fought the infection for as long as he possibly can, scared and confused at how the world can be so cruel to him until eventually he can no longer withstand it, and he passes away. But before passing away, he gains a brief period of emotional maturity. He feels he is about to escape the cruelty of the world and move on to a better place. He doesn't want to die, but when faced with inevitable death, he accepts that maybe it is for the best as he takes the disease with him. He may not have gotten to be happy, but without the rats, maybe his sister and his friends can be happy in his place. This brings us back to Amicia. This is a teenage girl ravaged by the horrors of war and plague and forced into situations where she had to kill other people to protect her little brother. We've been over this. But all of it is ultimately for nothing. As at the end of the game, she no longer has him. Even in the game's epilogue, the central theme of trauma is still being played out. The trauma of everything she's been through, now mixed with the grief of losing the little brother she would have done anything to save. Putting that into the context of the macula being the bubonic plague, she's the older sister who could do nothing while she watched her little brother slowly die in his bed. A play to Requiem is obviously not a story with a happy ending. It's not a game that magically ends with all the bad stuff over and everyone going to the local fair. It's not how trauma works. The existence of PTSD as a condition is one that lingers and festers. Veterans who suddenly panic during a firework display. Victims of abuse breaking down in supermarkets seemingly out of nowhere. Victims of childhood bullying freaking out as an adult in a high street because some strangers are laughing nearby. It doesn't simply go away. In many cases it never does. It just becomes more manageable. This is the tragedy of A Plague Tale Requiem. It is a tragically beautiful story and one that manages to show the heavy effects that trauma can have on a person without making it heavy-handed, or presenting it as something that can be magically solved. By the end of this journey, I was thoroughly impressed that this game, made on a limited budget by a team who previously made cheap licensed games, with lead actors who had never professionally acted before, managed to do all of this. And now those actors get to be in Final Fantasy XVI, so that's cool. The surface level enemies of A Play Tale Requiem are the rats and the soldiers. But underneath all of that, the real enemy is the spectre of trauma. And there is simply no other way to end a story like that than with a girl alone in the mountains processing her grief and figuring out how she can move forward. Thank you.